What? Today is a very special day because we just hit 69 subscribers. Epic! I cannot thank you guys enough. You've all been very supportive and have been giving me great comments and great discussions around my channel. And of course, you've been just as nice on Reddit. What? M for Tis. I wanted to be friends, but it seems like this isn't possible anymore. This means war! Not epic! So let's go back to my article that you criticized, the Battle of the Android Architectures. Subscribe to the blog now. You said that you wanted to stop reading after I said that it doesn't all boil down to personal preferences, that there is indeed a best architecture for Android development in 2020. But the hardest choices require the strongest wills. Or maybe you are right. There are indeed situations where each architecture shines. Maybe it really does boil down to personal preference. Wrong! MVP, MVVM, and MVI, the three shining architectures being used in 2020. You'll see MVP and MVVM in job specs everywhere. You'll also see MVI in the odd job here and there. Are there situations where each one shines more than the other? Of course, young Padawan. Thus, can you still objectify a best single one after acknowledging that fact? Of course you can. When you start a new app, whether it's destined to be a small project or you know it's going to be a project that will be running for years to come, you will have to make that choice. That's why I'm here to help you out. You can trust me. So yes, we will be doing another comparison video because as developers, we have to make important choices. Let's round up these three architectural patterns by going through a quick summary of them and weighing out the pros and cons of each one. It's bad. For the longest time, MVP has, without a shadow of a doubt, been the go-to architectural pattern. This was created during a time when MVC was the only known architecture. So let's dive briefly into the history of MVC and why MVP was created. The MVC architecture, model view controller, the XML layout was a view, where your UI-related code was supposed to be, and the activity was a controller meant to hold logic and bridge the model to the view. While this may sound like it makes sense, one major flaw with this architecture is that the view, the XML layout, can't really be tested without the controller. It was after people identified the problem that the MVP architecture was created. The model view presented pattern in this architecture both the XML layout and the activity together are the view. The presenter is a different class entirely. The model is still the same as it was in MVC, the activity source of data. But now the presenter isn't so tightly coupled to the other components. It can now properly act as a bridge between these components and maintain all of the activity's business logic while remaining as its own component. Thus the presenter can be tested without the view and conversely, the view can be tested without a presenter. MVP's main advantage comes in that out of many modern Android architectures, it remains as one of the simplest and is a great introductory pattern for newer developers. Even in bigger projects, this simplicity means that the project becomes easier to maintain as a whole. This fact is especially prominent when you introduce dependency injection, as you would in pretty much any major production app. Creating a dagger setup with the MVP architecture? Easy! Creating a dagger setup with the other Android architectures? That's a big hmm. MVP's main disadvantage, it's sneaky, but let me explain this one. The presenter will most often have a number of asynchronous code running in it, like when you make API calls or access local storage. These functions have callbacks that will execute when the async code completes. Now imagine a scenario where the async code is still running and your activity is no longer in the foreground or maybe it's just been destroyed entirely. Your presenter still has a callback listening and when your async code completes, your callback function executes and tries to change the text view in your view. But your activity is already destroyed along with the view. Boom! Crash, memory leak, problems everywhere. Now this problem doesn't only belong to MVP. It belongs to pretty much all the architectures really. 
but this stands out in MVP especially because the presenter's life cycle is tied to the activities. This means that it can't survive configuration changes that instantly destroy and recreate the activity like screen rotation. When this happens, your activity gets destroyed, your presenter gets lost, but somewhere in memory, your callback is still listening with a reference to the destroyed view and you have a new view and a new presenter starting async calls all over again. It's just chaos! So to round up MVP, its main advantage comes in its simplicity. It's easy to use and just as easy to learn. Its disadvantage comes in that the presenter's lifecycle is tied to the activity and it can't survive configuration changes. MVVM is now the talk of the town. One can even argue MVVM is the de jure method of architecting your app. Is that even a word? Don't take my word for it. Google MVP. You get some medium articles and a vandalic. A vandalic. You mean nothing to me. Google MVVM and you get the official docs. Checkmate, a vandalic. So what is MVVM exactly? The model view view model architecture replaces the presenter with the view model. While the presenter doesn't need to extend any other class, this new view model component has to extend the view model class, a eh? part of the Android architecture components which MVVM makes heavy use of. By extending this view model class, you inherit functionality that allows a view model to survive configuration changes like screen rotation, thus eliminating the main problem we had with MVP. Of course, you'll still have to make sure your async calls and observables, coroutines or whatever disposable things are disposed properly. But with MVVM, you know you only need to dispose of these when your activity is no longer in the foreground and not because of some configuration change. Another advantage MVVM has over other architectures is in its structure. You see, with MVP, the presenter keeps references to both the view and the model. While this makes sense for the architecture, there's no ideal way to have the presenter have references to multiple views. On MVVM, on the other hand, it's structured so that the view model doesn't have reference to the view at all, but rather, it's the view that has a reference to the view model, and it gets data from it by observing live data contained in the view model. These are objects whose data can be changed and delivered in real time to any observers. This means that you can have multiple views like fragments listening to the same view model without any major complications. This is a feature best done with MVVM, because this kind of functionality would be rather complicated and iffy in other architectures. It's possible still, but iffy. So that's plenty to praise about MVVM, but what about the disadvantages? I think the only real disadvantage MVVM has over the other architectures is in its complexity to set up with dependency injection. Without dependency injection, MVVM is possibly just as easy to set up as MVP per se, but introduce dependency injection with dagger or coin and things get a bit harder with MVVM. This is because of the way you create the view model, you see. With MVP, you can simply create an instance of the presenter like any other class normally. With MVVM, you need to create the view model with the view model provider's factory class to get the actual view model functionality of it. I'll skip the technicalities for now, but to set this up in an injection environment, you have to go through more loops than you would than if you would have just had to instantiate a class normally. It's not the hardest thing to do in the world, but it's not the easiest thing either. So as a summary, MVVM's main advantages are surviving configuration changes and its unique ability to have multiple fragments make use of the same view model. Its main disadvantage comes in its more complex dependency injection setup. The model view intent architecture isn't nearly as well known as the other two in this video, but it is gaining popularity. Intent in this architecture doesn't have anything to do with the Android intent class that we all know and love and use to start new activities, but rather, intent is used to describe a use case, a desire to perform an action, and in this architecture, this is used to describe a process from acquiring data to displaying it in the view. I know, it all makes sense in a minute. MVI is basically an upgrade of MVP. It still has the activity as the view, uses a presenter, and the model is a data source like normal. Where MVI does differ though is it introduces two new key elements into play, view states and view state reducers. The view state is a unique class to each activity that's meant to contain all the data the view needs to render itself. 
what's important to note about MVI is that the view should only ever receive the view state from the presenter, and nothing else. Single source of truth is the name of the game with MVI. This means that you only have a single observable to manage. Testing with this architecture almost feels good, in a way. An intent is a complete data flow from requesting data from the model, updating the view state, and passing the updated view state to the view for the view to render. Now I went on a lot about updating the view state and all, and well, this seemingly simple step actually introduces much complexity to the table. When we update the view state, we need to do so while retaining all the data that's already being held in the view state. This is where the state reducer comes in. The state reducer is a function that takes in the previous state and a new object containing new data and reduces them both into the new view state to be passed into the view. This reducer, however, can be the source of a lot of complexity, especially when you account for possible errors in each intent. The way your reducer is set up is unique to each activity, and more complex activities demand even more complex state reducers. So to summarize, MVI's main advantage comes through its strong adherence to the single source of truth principle, and its main disadvantage comes in through its complexity with state reducers. We, so we've rounded out the main advantages and disadvantages of the three architectural patterns. So after hours of deep thinking, after thousands of lines of code, hundreds of apps created and investigated, we can decide the best of the best of the architectural patterns. It is M, V, and VVM. MVVM has become the officially endorsed architecture by Google themselves for quote-unquote most situations, and for good reason. Its ability to survive configuration changes is a huge advantage it has over MVP and MVI. The fact that the view model has a lifecycle independent to that of the activity means that asynchronous calls can continue, data can be retained without using the saved instance state, and its structure allows multiple views to make use of the same view model, truly making the view model worthy of its namesake, a model of the view. On top of this, it's while using MVVM that one can make the most use out of the Android architectural components, a wide array of useful components created and maintained by Google's official team for building your app in an efficient and error-free manner. Of course, there will be situations where MVP or MVI is a better choice, but in most situations, the winner is MVVM. If you liked the video, feel free to subscribe to the channel for more Android content. Please, it'll help the channel a lot. I need to start earning money so I can pay my internet bills. Thank you so much for 69 subscribers. I couldn't think of anything more epic. <laughs> I'll see you in the next video. Happy coding.